on this episode of China Unscripted. Why Western companies that go into China always get screwed. And China's massive new disinformation campaign. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganeshda. And this podcast is sponsored by Drake Illusion. Drake Illusion is a software company that offers a cloud computing solution to manage all aspects of your business, accounting, product management, inventory, and more. Drake Illusion ERP system is capable of replacing your QuickBooks and provides a solution that can grow with your business. An enterprise solution for your small or mid-sized company is now available at your fingertips. So something kind of interesting happened to me today. I, I did a, a, I made a tweet about how China is a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture. And I was really surprised by the response. A lot of people were like, a uh, source? What are you talking about? That's like people had no idea. What was your source? Were you talking about something specific or just... Well, just that China is a country that uses gang rape as torture. This is something like, try it out. Google China gang rape. You'll see a lot of information about uh, it. So, so not, I'm not, not sure. visual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not visual. Well, but but I mean, like we we had a we had a a Uyghur on the podcast who was talking about what happened to him. Yes, uh, we've had many Uyghur women have talked about what's happened in the vocational training centers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes technically it's not gang rape; it's just rape. But yeah. that's not really. Yeah, some, sometimes it is just rape. Yeah, it's just one sometimes person. Sometimes it yeah. is gang rape. Yeah. Falun Gong practitioners experience this a lot too. I mean, I think it is a pretty common thing that happens in the prison and labor camp system. Mm -hmm. uh, especially there's this thing that they do where the essentially the guards will let the prisoners, like if you're a Falun Gong practitioner or, you know, let's say a house Christian or a Tibetan, somebody who gets put into a labor camp or a prison, right? Because um, there's, there's regular, like, actual criminals in there as well, as yeah, well there's, as dissidents. there's criminals in prisons. Like, it depends what you're in. If you're in, like, a re-education, like, if you're in kind of one of those brainwashing centers, it might just, like, be all Falun Gong or whatever, right? Because they're trying to essentially, they call it transforming, uh, transform your beliefs, uh, but if you're put into like a regular prison, there are actual hardened criminals in those prisons. So what they might do is just have like a the prisoners essentially, uh, you know, kind of do the torture for the guards in mm -hmm. a lot of ways to, to to kind of when they when the new like uh, prisoners of conscience come in. So uh, in in cases there have been uh, documented cases where women were put into uh, male prisoner cells and left there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, it's it's technically not the guards doing the raping, right? Which Which is interesting because this is not something that is just like a few cases of like uh, localized abuse. This is part of the system. Mm -hmm. Like as we were talking uh, with Levi Browdy last week, these, these labor camps, these detention systems, the Communist Party studies what works in these systems and things that work, they train other places to do. I think that there were two Uyghur women who went on BBC a few months ago and talked about the systematic rape that goes on in these concentration camps in Xinjiang and how in many cases it seemed that these were like outside men who were coming in and actually paying for the privilege of being able to rape Uyghur women. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, one woman talking about how she was essentially put in charge of like grooming the other women for like the young pretty girls to like be raped uh -huh. essentially. So it's, yeah, it's not something that's, it's something that's condoned. So they're and, basically running a human trafficking brothel. I mean, I'm sure they're making money off of it, too. You know, like the the thing that happens, there's a lot of corruption in China. And uh, a really, lot of, there yeah, is. Yeah, there is. Right. We've only talked about it a million times. But in and terms of like the prison system uh, where you have kind of like the prison guards or whatever, often there's kind of like an extortion racket they run on the side where they uh, might extort the family members of the prisoners to like, you know, if you pay us some money, 
you know, we won't rape your family, something like that, or uh, you know, you might be able to see your family member, uh-huh. or uh, you know, it's it's just like you know, you have to pay for them to be in prison, essentially. Like, there's there's all different ways to do it, but like, it's a money making system because the a lot of like China's government the financial system is kind of dif- dysfunctional in a certain way. It's like a lot of the local governments have to find funding for themselves for a lot of things. It's the same re- reason that uh, hospitals in China do forced organ harvesting because it's a way to make money. A lot of money. that Like a, a huge money. M- amount of money. But the, uh, yeah, so like prisons are also incentivized to make money. So uh, that's where the forced labor comes in. Yes, definitely. So, you know. H&M or some big new Nike, some big company contracts with a local supplier or a local company. And that company contracts with another local company. And that company does business with the labor camp. And then- Often disguised as something else. So you don't actually know. So you you have enough pieces of the supply chain that it's, it's hard for the Western company to track the extent of it if they're not super incentivized to track the extent of it. And I think they're not. Yeah. And I think that like often it is uh, the Chinese companies that they're working with that actually know what's going on, but they're essentially, they're incentivized to hide it from the, you know, foreign company. Uh, I remember Financial Times did this article a few years ago about essentially prisoners in China, like peeling garlic. Mm-hmm. To be exported, in, you know, like when you get a lot of the world's garlic apparently comes from China. And also, and this will this will tie back into everything, uh, China makes most of the world's solar panels. It seems like those are being made on the cheap by ethnic weaker slave labor. Yeah, I mean, we can't say all of them are being made that way. I think it's that recently a group found that some of the companies that make the polysilicon or whatever, like the actual like silicon like powder that goes into making the panels uh maybe are their factories are based in Xinjiang mostly and mm. there's questionable labor practices yeah and so this ties into something well the main issue john Kerry, uh biden's former vice president uh biden's climate envoy to china just got back from china and says said something like you know the us and china we disagree on human rights issues but we have to work together on climate issues. So and so like with the with the solar panels, like okay, we have to work together on climate. Solar panels are a way to deal with the climate, but they're made by ethnic slave labor. Do we ignore that because we're talking about climate? And this ties back into the whole China is a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture. Like like this should be the way any discussion about China should be framed. It's the same issue with uh, the genocide label. It's a highly charged emotional way to talk about it. And you couldn't you couldn't have John Kerry saying, well, you know, the U.S. and China, we disagree on using gang rape, but we got to work together on climate. Right. Or we disagree on genocide. But let's. Yeah, yeah it's the same kind but, of thing. But but I think like like if you could say that like climate is so important that we really should ignore these other things, which firstly, I think is stupid logic. But let's let's say that's your logic. It still doesn't work. And the reason is, if China is a country that uses gang rape as torture and is putting ethnic minorities in, you know, labor camps, then why would you trust them to fulfill their commitments to any agreement you make with them on climate? Like it is a it is a dishonest and evil regime. And just the idea that Yes, they could be doing these horrible things to their own people, and yet somehow they'll be trustworthy with international agreements, you know, on top of like what they did to Hong Kong, which is a total violation of an international agreement, on top of what they did with the South China Sea, which is a violation of more than one international agreement. Like, it's insane to trust the Chinese Communist Party to do their part on climate change. I think uh, semi in Kerry's defense, because this was the other part of his quote, was something about like how like the U.S. and China agree that this that climate change is something that affects 
their citizens of their countries. So it was almost like he was saying, well, China understands that this is something that is in their best interest, you know, but I don't think that's necessarily true that they see it as in their best interest. Well, I think that that's not quite what Kerry said. I think what Kerry said was that, like, climate change is the big issue that affects the citizens of of both of our countries. China understands that. I think he was saying, like, from his perspective, I mean, obviously, the, the Chinese government must understand that if this is hurting the Chinese people, that affects them, the Communist Party. Completely missing the fact that the Communist Party is an authoritarian regime that uses gang rape as a form of torture. They don't care if... People go without water. They don't care if people start to protest about the climate because they won't be able to. Well, you know, I would say, as Michael Bloomberg once said, you know, China is not really a dictatorship because they have to be accountable to their people. Well, he didn't say that they had to be accountable to their people. He said Xi Jinping has to be accountable to his constituency. constituency. And I don't think other party members. Yes, he he wasn't saying that the constituency was the Chinese people. Why do you keep making me defend these people? (laughs) This is what it's like to deal with Shelley accuracy ninja. Yeah, like this is not quite what he said. Yeah, I'm I'm very glad when I said China is a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture. There was no well, actually. I mean, they do. They do. They do. Right. Well, actually, Chris, it's the Chinese Communist Party, not China. <laughs> uh, but, but hey, I don't sound like a douche when I say it, right? Right? <laughs> no, no, you're you're super nice. I'm the one who sounds like a douche. Okay. But <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, but so so, I give an F in the chat. For I was Matt. I was exaggerating. No, please don't. No, it's uh, a good thing. I just found out what that means. F. Yeah, it's failure, right? No, no, no. it's uh, it's a reference to a. Uh, I believe it was Call of Duty. Do you know, Shelley? I don't know. I don't remember. So it was a video game, Call of Duty. By the way, we're going to start a video game channel. It's going to be great. Uh, Call of Duty, there's like uh, some scene where like your character like is at a funeral or something and has to, and so you, the player, has to press F to make your person salute in honor of somebody. So it's like- Saluting the fallen, basically. Got it. So F in the chat for Matt. Yeah, F me. (laughs) <laughs> hey, that was good. So, so you're you're right. I was somewhat exaggerating what Bloomberg said, and I appreciate your your accuratizing it. But the 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 point is that I I do agree that it's a if the the Communist Party suppresses dissent enough and keeps the right people with power happy enough, like just marginally above whatever that threshold of protest is then they can maintain power. And despite being the people's democratic dictatorship, it's not particularly a government of the people in general. It's just a government run by those elites who are trying to maintain power. And I would say, yeah, okay, you could argue any government is to a degree like that. But I don't think a lot of governments are to the extreme degree that the Chinese Communist Party run government is. Or simply put, China is a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture. Yeah, I mean, generally, it's not the elites who get gang raped, right? Like, like remember they aren't. Yeah, they yeah. aren't the ones. Well, no, remember well I mean, that sometimes case? eventually they get persecuted. Look Re- at well, yeah. doing the the oh. raping. I think is what Shelley yes. was getting at. Well, no, no, no. Actually, what I was going to say is, remember there was the case of that one kind of like upper middle class Chinese guy who uh, got was died in prison. After Oh, after playing hide and seek? No, it wasn't that case. It was like, was it that case? Now I'm getting this mixed up. There's like, then the police tried to say that he he was picked up at a karaoke bar, like implying that he was like, you know, at a bra- some, mm-hmm. brothel and that's what, but like he essentially died after being in police custody for like 24 hours or something. Like yeah, that. I think, I think they did say that uh, they, he was playing a game of hide and seek with the police and yeah. he died somehow. Yeah, there was, there was a guy who definitely that was the case. And I can't remember if this was the case or another one, but like it, it garnered a lot of anger the, in China, in China, because, you know, this was a case where it kind of made the, the upper middle class think that like this could. You know, the, the, this could the, happen to any of us. Like the police, the police are unjust, you know, because <laughs> generally, Revelation. well, generally because of the way that the propaganda works in China, it's assumed by the average Chinese person that if you're persecuted, it's your fault, right? Um, you've done something to deserve it, right? So, for example, like Uyghurs, uh, like this is all blamed on terrorism, as if like terrorism is an excuse to 
essentially imprison millions of people. Yeah, you know, but they're like all terrorists. The, but that's the that's the excuse. Like you know, similar with um, Tibetans, they're all separatists. With Falun Gong, it's you know they're heretical, they're occult, like this kind of stuff. So it's always seen as like, well, if you just were a reasonable person, uh, you know, the Chinese government wouldn't have to come after you. So when a case like that happens, where it seemed like he was just kind of like an average, like middle class guy. Then suddenly there was a lot of anger. Yeah. That's another reason that like whenever it comes to stuff involving children in China, like that's the one time when people will really get angry in protest, like with the baby formula that Cause caused. Because it's, the... it's their own kid. And and typically families have one kid or two at most now. So it's like people feel really. Yeah. And also just like, you know. Like you don't have extras. It's hard to say that the kids deserved it, right? It's yeah. hard to be like, well, the kids had it coming to them. Like right. they listened to hostile but, foreign forces. But I, but like you've got people across the entire spectrum of Chinese society being persecuted, from the poor farmers, which the middle class may not care much about, to, uh, you know, you've got top-ranking Chinese Communist Party members who have been persecuted in the last five years. Uh, Bo Xilai was a, a top party member who could have been a contender for for. Presentator, you got Zhou Yong Kong, who was one of the the top members of the Politburo Standing Committee, both sent to prison or or at least the Communist Party's. Um, they're 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 sh- they're they're, they're special as uh, part prison. of a power struggle, not because of any of the crimes, actual crimes they committed. Uh, but well, they did. I mean, you know, supposedly it was for corruption. 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 Yeah. I mean, yeah, they didn't talk about the way that either of those people had specifically gone after Falun Gong. Actually, it's probably one of their their by big crimes. putting them in labor camps to suffer right. gang rape as a form of torture. That, in, interestingly, those two party members I just mentioned had initially risen to power because they were so good at putting Falun Gong uh, people in prison. And then when they got taken down by the anti-corruption campaign, none of the Falun Gong stuff was officially mentioned. But that's, of course, because the Communist Party just can't redress this issue. Because it's too complicated, but like, well, I mean, it's still going on, so you can't. Because they're still they're still doing it to Falun Gong, and I didn't realize till last week with when we had uh, Levi Browdy on the podcast, like twenty to forty million people still practice in China. Like that's a very substantial number of people. Well, they're but, engaged in civil disobedience. Yeah, but and then that that doesn't include the number of people who probably just practice Falun Gong like in their homes or whatever, right? But no, my point isn't isn't about Falun Gong. My point is that when you have all these different groups who are being persecuted, including high-ranking Communist Party members, it becomes increasingly dangerous from a, from a power perspective for the Communist Party leadership to keep going after people. Because like, yes, Xi Jinping can take down his political enemies who are top-ranking party officials, but there's a balance because if he does it too much, then every party member is going to be like, well, am I next? Maybe I don't want to be like, maybe I should rise up. And I don't think we're there yet with party elites. We're not. Or if we were, we'd see it. But like, it could get to that point if you persecute too many powerful people. I think, though, that people in China are kind of, because there hasn't been as much, except for kind of like the corrupt officials, like the tiger and flies kind of campaign. I think that People are not realizing exactly what could happen to them under the system because unless you were part of Falun Gong or you're Uyghur or Tibetan, you know, like you were kind of left alone for the last 20 some years, right? Well, to an extent, unless you like, you know, compare Xi Jinping to biker mice on Mars, then okay. you get in jail. Or, but, but, or but a lot of these the are, poo. but these are seen typically as isolated incidents. Like, oh, Bo Xilai was taken down because he was corrupt, but that's an isolated incident. Oh, you know, this thing happened at, at the elementary school my kid goes to and I don't like it, but also it's still isolated. It's not part of any kind of systematic thing. And we really should ask the central government for help or ask the Communist Party for help. Well, I think what's happening now is that the Communist Party is more visibly taking control in a lot of ways. Like we see this now with the whole, like they're out for the tech companies right now, right? Mm. Like uh, Alibaba was first, now they're after Tencent, like there's essentially like all these tech companies that were allowed a certain amount of freedom to become like humongous, like wealthy companies are being kind of told by the Communist Party, like 
actually, you know, we're still the boss. Well, and so that's that's the issue, because we're talking about how your average Chinese citizens, it's like, it, it's the same thing about like, you know, oh, they came for the gypsies, but then they came for the Jews and it'll never come for me. The Communist Party, like outside of Xi Jinping, this has been going on since the Communist Party started. Mm-hmm. People kind of are able to operate under this illusion that they'll never come for me. And that is what happened with the tech companies. It seemed like the Communist Party was backing off. Sure, they still needed to have high level Communist Party affiliations. They needed to help the sons and daughters of top Communist Party officials get rich or do business with their companies. So it was just an illusion that the party was backing off while the party was still there controlling so many things. Alibaba, if it weren't for Jack Ma's connections to, what was it, Jiang Zemin's son? Mm -hmm. Like he never would have been able to rise. So it was still the shadow of the party was there. But it was just enough that people were like, oh, well, this will be fine. I won't ever be persecuted. But if you understand that China is a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture, you'll understand that they probably don't have any scruples. Yeah, and, you know... Scrupulous. It's one of those things that human rights groups have been documenting for, you know, decades, right? But it's not the kind of stuff we talk about when it comes to China. Well, this is why you were mentioning this earlier that, uh, before the podcast, how, how... Desperately, the Communist Party is trying to fight the allegations of genocide and particularly all the sexual abuse that's happening to the Uyghurs. Yeah, there's a huge disinformation campaign going on right now from Chinese state run media, from the Chinese Communist Party, uh, fighting the idea that there's genocide in Xinjiang, that there's even any slave labor in Xinjiang, that anything is going wrong in Xinjiang at all. And they're doing it at kind of every level, like they're using state run media uh, propaganda to try to discredit people who have talked about this. Like they're going after researchers who have done uh, research, like estimating how many Uyghurs are in concentration camps. They're like going after them personally, not just like trying to discredit their work, but also just being like uh, Adrian Zenz, who's one of the, he's a German researcher who's been on the kind of the forefront of looking at this. He's an academic. They are calling him like a far right like person, you know, like Ooh, all right. So, so they're they're basically just using ad hominem attacks, yeah, essentially. De- where like it's definitely. nothing to do with the work; it has to do with other things. Yeah, that they think trying they to make people for. like radioactive, right? Um, with uh, there was another a woman, Vicky Xu, who is uh, a works. She's a Chinese Australian woman who works for the uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, and she wrote a large chunk of the their report on. Uh, how there's slave labor in Xinjiang. And they've been so like the Ministry of State Security has been following her friends and family in China. They started like a smear campaign on Chinese social media to accuse her of being like a sexually promiscuous. Like it's just like it, they're it's like weird attacks that they're using. But so, essentially because they, they, they can't deny the things she's she's actually saying. Well, about- I mean. China. Also, they want to call the Australian Strategic Policy Institute like a, a, a you know, a hostile foreign force that's so they, being so, set up by the Australian U.S. governments to, so, you know, bring, so they just bring... make up things about people who, who criticize the CCP. Well, it's like you you were saying this earlier, Shelley, that like with the 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 the, the two Uyghur women who have come out and like d- described the sexual yeah. So torture. then the the Chinese Communist Party tried to go after them. Uh, and not just them. There was there were other Uyghurs who came out and talked about uh, what's happening in the concentration camps. And for example, one of the women, you know, talked about being in a camp and her experience there. And then the Chinese Communist Party trotted out her brother on state-run television to talk about what a liar she is. Like she's outside of China now. She's in another country. Her brother is still in China. And then he's on state-run television talking about like, oh, she's always been a liar now and, she's just being used by like the western powers and you know? wasn't there also stuff like oh she's actually sexually promiscuous i forget or was I don't it another know. one but anyways yeah. the point is they're trying to say oh no like this week we're talking about rape no 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 she's sexually promiscuous she's she's a like, liar blah, yeah blah, blah. they seem to like to use the sexually promiscuous thing with women but like also just in general they're just like okay yeah they, they're being used like uh by western powers that's another thing because the State Department, the U.S. State Department was the first 
to come out, like the first government entity to come out and say that there's genocide in Xinjiang. And now the- That was U- under Pompeo, right? Yeah, that was under Pompeo at the beginning of January of this year, or not the beginning, but in January of this year. And now the Canadian parliament has said that, the UK parliament has said that. Like there's been, uh, you know, the US, the EU, and the UK all sanctioned Chinese officials for the genocide and crimes against humanity. Well, which is great, but you do see a lot of resistance in these countries among some factions in the government society. They don't like that claim. Right. Like the Trudeau cabinet, they didn't vote on like the genocide thing. Yeah. I mean, the UK parliament, I think it was the House of Commons that, you know, voted that this was genocide. And then the British government, like the, like Boris Johnson's government, like was like, we do not have a comment on this, you know? Well, it's because it goes back to the issue. If you actually acknowledge like, oh, the Chinese Communist Party, they're committing genocide. They use rape. Then you can't have any kind of normal interactions with them. You can't just like hand wave it like, well, we don't we have different cultural well, we norms or whatever. But sign we this do. trade deal, you know, between the EU and, and China. Or yeah. invest your bonds yeah. in China or invest in Chinese bonds. Yeah. So this is but like the key fact that now governments are coming out, like, first of all, this makes the Chinese Communist Party really nervous. So that's one reason they're really going hard on this whole disinformation campaign, trying to say that everything's fine in Xinjiang. But another thing is that it, they can kind of use this to their advantage because it's the U.S. who's saying this, like it's these foreign governments who are saying it. So they can kind of use that whole, like, this is Western imperialist countries who are trying to keep China down and they're using their puppets, the Uyghurs. Like it takes all agency away from, you know, the survivors of this type of torture in China. It's just saying that the Uyghurs are just like the patsies, right? Yeah. Of like the the Western imperialists, the CIA, uh, like the NED. Like it goes into like straight that type of conspiracy theory territory. But there are essentially like publications that will say this, or like Western publications that will say this. There are scholars that will say this kind of stuff, like academics who are willing to come out and say, well, you know, it's not technically genocide. Like, we shouldn't really be calling it genocide. And then the Chinese Communist Party uses that, right? And they use that in their campaign where they're like, oh, like the, the you know, these respected Western academics agree with us, you know, that this is something that, like, it's the evil Western imperialists who are using this whole thing to attack us. And they'll even, I mean, like, we're talking about every level from using, trying to use foreign government officials. Like, I think I saw a uh, Chinese uh, state-run media article about how the Egyptian prime minister or somebody who was a supported, you know, China's efforts in Xinjiang, you know. He's a gold, isn't he? <laughs> You've been watching I've been a watching a lot of Stargate, Stargate. lately. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just like they use everybody from government officials, academics, business people, all the way down to like people on TikTok and YouTube. Like Someone on TikTok said it's not happening. Gotta believe it. No, I mean, seriously, there's a lot of like, yeah. like Xinjiang, like genocide denialism on TikTok. Well, there's even like these YouTubers, white YouTubers in China talking about like spreading the party line. Yeah, it's 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 amazing that suddenly a bunch of, you know, Western YouTubers who have suddenly gotten access to go to Xinjiang uh, and like are walking around like like the town square in Urumqi saying or in a field. Yeah. Like I have to talk about the field guy, but like, you know, they'll be walking around going, there is no genocide here. It's like we made fun of the Chinese state run media reporter that was mm-hmm. doing that, where she was like standing in the middle of the town square going like there's no genocide uh, yeah, Western YouTubers are doing that. There was one guy who this channel is essentially a bunch of like Western YouTubers who are defending the Chinese government, essentially. And he was in uh, Xinjiang in a cotton field and, you know, basically like asking the farmer whether they used slave labor and, you know, being like, oh, you know, look at all this high tech like these high tech tractors that you can control with your iPad that they're using. And uh, look, they have a drone and talking to them about how much money they can make and how prosperous they're. It was totally the CCP's like poverty alleviation propaganda being pushed by this YouTube channel. And then the funniest thing was that he runs into the CCTV reporter, like Chinese state run media reporter. And she like, 
you didn't see this on his channel, but you saw it on the CGTN channel where she she was like in the field and was like, we've run in. We just happened to run into this famous YouTuber who, uh-huh. uh, you know, happens to be like in Xinjiang. So we decided to talk to him about what his impressions are. And then if you watched the Chinese state run media report and the the YouTubers report, like it basically like they were following him around the whole day. Like, it was the same thing. Like, they showed the same footage. Like, it mm-hmm. was just kind of like, you know, him, like, uh, playing a Uyghur instrument in a funny Uyghur hat and, like, all this kind of stuff where it was just so blatant because, you know, BBC, CNN, they try to go to Xinjiang. They get followed everywhere by the police. They don't, they can't see anything. Mm-hmm. And this one, like, YouTuber, yeah, it just happens to be in a field, in a cotton field, and bumps into the the Chinese state-run media, yeah. like it's just. Well, I think this is the flip side of uh, of what we were talking about about how China is, is terrified of the genocide label. Um, you know, coming up in July, it's the hundred year anniversary of the Communist Party, and so there is this massive push to make sure the people of China aren't having any wrong thoughts about the party. Uh, you know, they're asking people to report friends and family that make, you know, illegal or harmful comments on history. At the end of last year, Xi Jinping made this uh, speech about how they need to really boost youth patriotism. Creepy enough. And now there's been like a like these new uh, anti spying, anti espionage regulations targeting hostile foreign forces and whatever. And I think the, the real point of this is to make sure Chinese people don't have any access to foreigners so they can't hear like any of these messages like they don't want chinese people leaving china and then like you know hearing from a friendly youtube show that you know china is using gang rape as a form of torture well i mean like there's certain westerners it's okay to you know yeah like but... like those youtube channels based in china where like you know everything's fine yeah but like part of these regulations are basically it applies to like any kind of group in China. Mm-hmm. And so like even it seems like even universities or private co- uh, private companies. And so part of the regulations basically like require like debriefing of people like after they go abroad to like come back and like kind of talk about like everyone they've they've met. Yeah. And we'll have to see exactly how these are implemented. Right. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's 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 interesting because this is not the first time. Do you guys remember that like cartoon about the white guy named david yeah 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 who like was taking who's dating this chinese girl and took advantage of her innocence to uh you know get some sensitive information from her about her like she was working for some company yeah like it was just like this comic strip about how like dangerous it is to talk to you know foreigners who may be trying to get you to accidentally spy for them or wait so is this the thing where the chinese communist party accuses other people of doing the things that the Chinese Communist Party is actually doing? Exactly. Global Times just put like put out a big piece about like, you know, how foreign like hostile foreign forces will target, you know, young people or young active internet users or college students and use money or beauty <laughs> to influence them and send them down the wrong path. Uh, yeah, my favorite example that Global Times had there was of some guy who got an inter- a journalism student who got an internship with a foreign media. Yeah, he was a journalism student. Yeah, in China and got an internship in China with foreign media. And a, a lot major of, Western Yeah. And a lot of company. a lot of Chinese um, staff who work for these Western media companies are like they're at a much higher risk than the Western staff at those media companies. Yeah, and so he was he was arrested. Like this twenty year old guy was arrested in two thousand nineteen for meeting with uh, here. I, I have it here. Uh, yeah, meeting more than a dozen officials of a, a Western country, uh, twenty hostile foreign groups, providing evidence that could be used to stigmatize China. And so the point is that, that we made in the episode was that it sounds like this journalism student was doing journalism. Yeah. But because a lot of these Chinese, also these Chinese workers for these media companies, they can't be classified as journalists. Technically, they have to be like news assistants or something. So there there have been multiple cases in the last year of uh, people being arrested, the news assistants who work for these media companies. 
So there's definitely a, there's definitely a crackdown going on. Yeah, and I think it is because they're the 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 message is kind of getting out about the Chinese Communist Party slowly in the West because there's still many uh, politicians and the business sector that really do not want us talking about China as a country that commits genocide because mm-hmm. it it will damage it'll damage the politicians' ability to make the deals they want to make because they're all connected to the various business sectors as well. And then the Wall Street who, you know, just want to, or like NBA, Mark Cuban, there are customers. Yeah, I mean, there's always, it might not be like a direct like bribe or something like that, right? But there's often mm-hmm. some type of self-interest involved uh, among the people who are saying things like, well, you know, uh, like it's it's not really genocide or, you know, this is, we shouldn't be using that word. Like, yeah. Right. And one of the, the challenges is that because over the last 20 plus years, Western companies have become so integrated with the China market that like, basically, uh, I can hardly imagine any billionaire in the world who, who doesn't have some uh, current or former connection to the China market, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's very hard to be a billionaire and not have some connection to China. And so when you have the, the elite of the elite who all have their fingers in this to some degree. It's, it's just like to, to to get them to to back off and be like, well, actually, we need to stop the Chinese Communist Party or we need to criticize them for, you know, using gang rape as a form of torture. You just can't. It's just very difficult to get people to, to change their view on this. And if they don't think China has uh, personally screwed them, then they're just not going to be super interested in it. And I think a lot of them prefer to just not not touch the subject. But uh, like this is a problem when you have so much policy uh, and politics uh, influenced by a small number of, of people. What? And really, like this, you make a good point, Matt, that like, you know, if Western businesses actually, if they understood what the Chinese Communist Party was, you know, they want to make money in China. They want to get the China market, blah, blah, blah. If they actually understood what was happening, it would actually be more beneficial to these companies. Take Tesla as an example, uh, which is just the most recent of a long string of companies trying to get into the China market. When Tesla first went into China, state-run media was like praising them, like great, great. Tesla's great. And now they're being ruthlessly attacked in Chinese social media, on Chinese state-run media for being, what would they say? Arrogant. Like, arrogant. Uh, all kinds of rumors about their cars being dangerous or unsafe. Um, they're, they're, they're letting these kind of rumors spread organically on Chinese social media. There were protests at the Shanghai Auto Show against Tesla. And people talked about that online. That doesn't happen in China unless it's state backed yeah and, and so like it, it just goes to show you that very smart people like Elon Musk can be so like wear these like rose colored the word glasses. is stupid the word stupid they're stupid smart people can be so stupid and like I mean obviously we were you know warning Tesla and years ago like don't go into the China market it's a bad idea you're gonna get screwed and this is what, what always happens is that the Chinese Communist Party wants these Western companies to come in, bring in their expertise, create factories, and then their technology is either transferred through joint ventures or it's just stolen. And the people who work at those factories learn how to do that work. And then inevitably, what we're going to see is, is in China is the electric vehicle market and the battery market that Tesla is dominating, these are going to be uh, exploited by Chinese homegrown companies. So what- That will use ethnic slave labor to make stuff cheaper. Right, and so and so, I don't think we've seen this quite yet, but I bet, I bet you anything, we're gonna see this over the next three to four years, is that the market that Tesla has now in the US, uh, maybe not cars, but definitely batteries, and other like those kind of components are gonna increasingly come from China. And a big part of that 
will be technology based on what was taken from Tesla. And because that's what happened with solar panels. That's what happened with um, with windmills, right? It's just, it's it's going to happen. And Tesla has given up their intellectual property, willingly or unwillingly. And then it's just going to be sold right back to Americans at a cheaper rate. So of course, the average American consumer who doesn't want to have to think about all this, you know, connections is going to, is happy. Well, I mean, also, it's just often really hard to find out whether things are made in China, right? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. that's true. But this is a situation where if Elon Musk had, had said, well, let's see, China is a country that uses gang rape as torture. Is there a possibility that they might not be nice to me? No, because he's wealthy and he was invited by the Chinese Communist Party to come. It's because they don't look at it that way. They don't look at it like, oh, yeah, this is they're committing genocide. Well, I mean. But but surely they won't lie to me, a charismatic billionaire. Well, I think the, the thing, though, is like when Tesla went into China, right? Like at the time, it wasn't as clear what was happening in Xinjiang. Nobody was really talking about what was happening to Falun Gong. Like it wasn't, it wasn't clear if you've been barely paying attention. Well, if I mean, I think even China if you're a fairly, I think if, even if you're a fairly like worldly person, like I just did an interview last week with Al Jazeera, and uh, about congratulations, the, by the way. Um, thanks. It was about the Xinjiang. Uh, I think they just asked me because they can't find enough people to talk about it, hmm. but. Um, it was about you know like the this the propaganda campaign that the the uh, Chinese Communist Party is doing about Xinjiang right now, and they had basically hired uh, because Al Jazeera is not based in New York City. They had like hired a producer to kind of be the person to like ask Someone me the local. questions, some like a local producer to ask me the questions. And he was a fairly like worldly person, but like I definitely freaked him out. Like I scared that guy. <laughs> By talking about everything that the Chinese Communist Party is doing, mm. uh, you know, talking about like their propaganda, talking about how they're trying to use that to counter this genocide stuff, like specifically organ harvesting. Yeah, too. and I talked about organ harvesting, and like it just like I could just see his like increasingly shell shocked expression because you know this is not stuff that comes through. Well, so that is that is that was what surprised me when I made like my tweet about. China being a country that uses gang rape as torture. People were having emotional reactions because like they couldn't deal with it because this is just it's not how they think about China. And so if this were the reality, if if the average person knew this stuff, then it's not like it's not like Elon Musk would be like, well, I'll lie to myself in some ways and like still try and go in the China market. It would be impossible because no one would accept that these foreign companies are going into China because the people would be like, it's not OK. Yeah, I mean, this is why they're fighting the genocide label so hard is because the Chinese Communist Party cannot let themselves become North Korea. It's why the Olympics are so important. Oh, yeah. The Beijing 2008 Olympics, that that's a big reason why people don't think about the Chinese Communist Party the way they should. And now they're really trying to make sure this 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics also goes off without a hitch because they want to have the same soft power effect that the uh, 2008 Olympics well, I mean, jokes on the CCP because no one watches the Winter Olympics. This is true. I mean, I, curling doesn't have quite the same, you know. I mean, cachet is the hundred meter dash, right? Or I mean, they. I guess you do have like figure skating, right? Well, there's yeah. the I one mean, where people ski. people do watch the Winter there, Olympics. There is yeah. one game where they like ski down a slope and then pull out a gun and shoot something. That's pretty cool. I don't know what yeah. that's called. I can't remember the name right now. It's either. called ski and shoot. <laughs> no, Skirball. it is not. At, 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 at any rate, well, well, I, I but I think that the, the point about the Olympics is good. And and you had a guest, Chris Fenton, on China Uncensored last week, mm -hmm. who talked about the importance of using that as a form of leverage to get the Chinese Communist Party to make certain concessions, whether it's human rights or or political concessions or Hong Kong stuff. And I, you know, I hope that Western governments listen to what Chris Fenton said. Well, they will listen to what the people say. And this is why it needs to get into the general public consciousness. What kind consciousness is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The general public consciousness about what the Chinese Communist Party is. And that's why the general public needs to watch China Unscripted. And China Uncensored. And China Uncensored. I think we have more of a chance with China Uncensored. 
Well, anyway, you never know. This episode could go viral and get like a million views. That's true. It is is a technically it's, a possible it's thing like, to happen. Share this episode with everyone you know, people you meet on the streets. Um Maybe we should give, like, put it on a CD and give it out to people. <laughs> <laughs> my my, my mixtape of, of podcasts. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh! But yeah, I mean, it it is like they've done such a good job, and this isn't just something that affects people outside China. Although I think we ha- it, but people inside China don't understand what's going on in China, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. I think that like we have less of an excuse because. Like there's not the censorship issue and the firewall if issue. If you Google China gang rape, you will be educated. Uh, yeah, maybe you want to throw a few other keywords in there. Like, I checked it. Okay, okay. It's it's safe. You okay. will be well. You will be mentally disturbed, but it's news articles okay. that come up. Especially okay. it's Google. Google's not gonna okay. take you to the dark web. Um. Anyway, so, but like, I mean, I even remember like a couple years ago, we interviewed this guy who was a Falun Gong practitioner who was at this demonstration on April 25th, 1999, right? In front yeah, of- just had the anniversary last yeah, week. Yeah, oh, in front of the, in front of uh, Zhou Nanhai, which is like the leadership compound in Beijing, um, where like Falun Gong practitioners had started being arrested in China and they went to Zhou Nanhai to like, like basically peacefully stand outside the- Actually, it seems that they were trying to find the petition office because in China, legally, technically, you can petition the government. There's like this office that's kind of hidden away on a side street that happens to be near the leadership compound. What's the point you were getting at? But uh, well, the point is that like the way that it was covered in Chinese state run media is that these people were trying to surround the leadership compound as if like they were there to like hurt the leadership. Oh, but they actually were just lining up outside the petition office. They were trying to find the petition office and it seems like the police were kind of hurting them to be outside the leadership. They, they lied. Instead. It was propaganda. Wait, anyway. wait, you're saying the Chinese Communist Party spreads lies and propaganda? No, that's... That's the issue. Well... People don't think of that. The But the guy that we were talking to, I just remember very clearly him talking about how he just was... It just never occurred to him that the the Communist Party would would start arresting Falun Gong people. Well, this kind of yeah. ties into what we were saying earlier. The major, like there was 70 to 100 million people practicing Falun Gong before the persecution began. Those are government statistics. And a lot of this was the Chinese middle class, people who weren't doing anything that was against the party. Yeah. And then suddenly. It's against the party. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's the thing that like a lot of people were kind of politically naive at the time because it's it had been 10 years since the Tiananmen Square massacre. There hadn't been any big political campaigns in between where like people were being arrested in mass for anything, right? And so like people, even people in China like are kind of naive in a lot of ways about what the Chinese Communist Party can do. Well, it'd be like if like all of those dancing grannies Suddenly, the Communist Party said, "No more dancing grannies," and then they're all just like, "We were just, we were just, we're just dancing grannies. What's wrong? We're not against the party. What's happening?" Well, you know, dancing—the kind of dancing they're doing—is basically a form of Western imperialist culture. I heard they're funded by the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Don't. I don't know. This is not I give think... the Communist Party ideas. I mean, no, also no, no. though, I don't Those know. Those dancing grannies are ferocious. Yeah. If the party goes against them, the Communist Party's going down. I was actually <laughs> going to make the point that we don't want to make enemies of the dancing grannies. That's where I was going. Yeah, no, oh. I, I'm also terrified of yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I, I posted on the China Uncensored Instagram like a photo of like these dancing grannies. They're in a parking lot and they just like in a mass grab a car, move it out of the way so they have room to dance. They just move a parked car. They just move a parked car. They just cool. All right. pushed it, right? They, like they I, grabbed yeah. it and pulled it. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, don't like don't make enemies of the- No. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, I, if, if you are a Chinese dancing granny watching this show, we all highly respect what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think also like like people of that age in China are, are very tough people because they've They're been survivors. through- They're survivors. They've survived- the Great Leap Forward, like mass starvation. They've survived the Culture Revolution political campaign. They survived, you know, the leadership coup that happened after Mao died. They survived, you know, the Tiananmen Square massacre. They survived like all the things that came after that. And like, like yeah, that stuff didn't happen that long ago. They're they're just like, like our like, like our grandparents' yeah, age. Ch- ch- Chinese elderly are like the toughest people on the planet. 
And uh, yeah, so the Communist Party had better not mess with them. Absolutely. They created their own worst enemy. Yeah. If they turn on the grannies. Yeah. So at any rate, uh, what we're talking about, don't trust the Chinese Communist Party. Oh, we're talking about what they did to Falun Gong and uh, how this one guy we interviewed didn't like, who's like, didn't believe the Communist Party would go after Falun Gong because, like, why would you go after Falun Gong? Yeah, I think there was a lot of like from other people we've talked to this kind of like idea that like if we just explain to the government that you know when we talked to um, that one Uyghur scholar a couple weeks ago who was raped in the Chinese. Uh, prison mm -hmm. and he was saying that he honestly believed before he was arrested for starting a kindergarten that like the whole issue between the uyghurs and the and the chinese communist party was a miscommunication issue you can explain it away right. obviously it's a logical regime that will not just do horrible things yeah i mean if they just had more uyghurs in like positions of power that could kind of explain. And then like, there wouldn't be well, this misunderstanding. Like, well, now the Uyghurs are in positions of being in like essentially state run brothels. Uh, yeah. So, so and, and that's the other issue. Like we can explain to the Chinese Communist Party why it's in their interest to work with us on climate change issues. But that has no impact on their decision making because they don't freaking care. You know, another good example of this sort of like anyone can find themselves on the wrong end of the Communist Party's wrath, Chloe Zhao, mm -hmm. the Chinese uh, director who just won an Oscar for her film Nomadland for directing it. What first Asian winner, first, second woman? First Asian winner, second woman, first woman of color, like a lot of these. You know, like it was historic win, and then and as, as, the, as Oscar, the Global Times had. Referred to her back in March, the pride of China. Yeah, that's right. Like she at and, and Astley, at the Oscars, she gave a speech about uh, classical Chinese poetry. Well, I mean, she it wasn't about that, but she did talk about it. She talked about it. It's, it's the kind of soft power thing that the Communist Party really loves, as you said, Mark. Back in, as you said, Matt. Back in March, <laughs> they. They were talking about how great Chloe Zhao is and like, you know, she has a big following in China because it's there's there's that sense of pride. Like, oh, this is a Chinese national who has risen to the top of the Western society. That's a great story, except some Chinese netizens found uh, an interview she gave back in 2013 where she was asked, why did she get into directing? And she mentioned how growing up in China was like a place where everybody, not everybody lies, China, there are lies China, everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. now she's been, what's the term? Deep people? Deep person. Deep person. Well, she's, she's been canceled. But like, I, I think, you know, when, when you talk about cancel culture in the West and we talk about it in China, like it's, it's the same, ultimately the same principle. But in China, what's happened is the entire state apparatus gets behind canceling someone. So like, it's an even scarier thing. Well, and so this is, this is the challenge a lot of, Chinese netizens are having because they're like, wait, I thought we were supposed to feel proud about this woman. Yeah. Like, wait, we're not allowed to talk about her now? It's interesting because she's also, you know, she comes from kind of a privileged background. Her dad was like a big executive of, mm -hmm. at some big companies. Her stepmom is like an actress in China. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, she's not like, it's not like she was making really controversial. She's not a dissident, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, her parents sent her to boarding school in the UK and in, in LA for high school. So like she, she, she comes from this kind of privileged background. And yet, like, if they decide that, like, you know, you're, you, you're now persona non grata for something that you said that. For one thing you said years ago, and, almost a decade ago. And then like, that's, and I think also there's this kind of like domino effect essentially where. You know, if it's kind of not clear whether it's not okay or not, like the the default is it's not okay. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, it's all censored. And I think like there's been some kind of a little bit of pulling back from the state run media side since she won the Oscar mm -hmm. uh, because there started to be all of these media reports in the West about how China censored the Oscars because of Chloe Zhao. And so suddenly this is like a bad PR move. 
Uh huh. From them, so now the Global Times has kind of pivoted to like being like, well, you know, her film's not anything real special, but you know, yeah, it's still nice that like, you know, it's that she's one, but it really her win just shows how much racism and sexism there is in the U.S. because it took ninety three years for like a like an Asian woman to win it's, best director. It's the poisoning the wealth thing we were talking about earlier. How like you know they 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 will attack you for something else to try and distract from the main point. So they basically attacked the entire like western movie culture for not having enough asians which is not the point of what happened well i think also it's that there seems to be some kind of uh i think even like five or ten years ago uh there would have been more kind of pride at chloe Zhao succeeding in the west right but now the chinese communist party is trying to build up its own culture to be um just as good as or so it maybe doesn't matter better. if you win the oscars what really matters if you win like yeah the, the chinese version the chinese equivalent of the oscars like the the point is to like make the chinese institutions chinese like uh awards the chinese olympics or whatever right like make that like even more prestigious than the western versions and the great thing about the 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 great thing that happened with chloe Zhao is and this kind of ties back to tesla she is uh, directing The Eternals, the next big Marvel movie. And, you know, I'm sure in Disney's calculation, they were thinking, oh, boy, we get this famous Chinese uh, director. It's going to do great in China. And Marvel has done great in China, lots of big money. But now it's all kind of up in the air because who knows how the Communist Party is going to treat a foreign movie directed by a non-person, a person yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, she could be rehabilitated. She could be rehabilitated. Right, but the the fundamental problem is that Hollywood wants to do business in China, a country that uses gang rape as a form of torture. Yeah, I mean, oh, I, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, I think that, where's the source? <laughs> well, I think that I mean that's not, you know, asking you for a source isn't like unreasonable. Yeah. But 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 there are the sources though. Yeah, just just Google China gang rape. People really seem to have a hard time with doing that uh but i think it's it's also the way that disney thinks about pandering to the chinese audience which is not and uh or, yeah. oh, okay but like we're getting to the end of the podcast I'm yeah sorry. well I, my point was going to be that like just be <laughs> your point before i said something really stupid <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't going to put it that way i'm i'm really good today at putting things into the right uh i'm framing things okay, right okay okay Well, my point was going to be that Disney thinks that, you know, having like having a Chinese director would like boost the film. But that's not really necessarily like how it works in China, because there's lots of films in China that are all made by Chinese directors. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't quite work the same way uh, as it does somewhere where like in America, where there aren't a lot of Chinese American directors. Now, the, the way to pander to the Chinese Communist Party is to have a line in your movie, like in the Transformers movie, I think it's Transformers 4, where they had a line like, hey, let's call the central government for help. It was help. in Hong Kong. Yeah. And they wanted to call the central government for help. You're like, just like that kind of thing. And obviously, we've talked before about movies that go even further than that. But yeah, that level of pandering, Hollywood is, is willing to do. But- also, like the the irony of, of this is that Hollywood is like what's happening to Hollywood in China is basically what happened to Tesla, what's happened to all these Western companies. And the path for Hollywood is, ooh, look at this great China market. You know, they start to make some money. Some of it's artificial because of the the way they inflate theater numbers, but but a lot of it's, you know, real money. Uh, and then you know, you've got, but they have to hire locals and do joint ventures and stuff. And this, when they film in China, and and now you've got Chinese homegrown film studios that have learned all these techniques. Uh, they're making Chinese homegrown movies uh, that are that are of really good quality. Well, I mean, I don't know that they're all but, of but, really good but quality, it, but the the point is that the state is behind the Chinese homegrown movie and, industry, and eventually Hollywood is just going to get partly or fully kicked out of China. So that that market can be dominated by Chinese movies, and those Chinese movies are going to be able to are going to show in, you know, American uh, theaters that are owned by Chinese billionaires. Right. I mean, AMC was purchased by a Chinese company. I'm not sure if it's still owned by Dalai and Wanda. Has, Dalai and Wanda. has had some issues. They've had lately. some issues. I mean, also theaters have had issues in the last year. But 
Uh, but not like, in China. I just saw something about how it's the largest movie audience in the world now. Right, well, oh, hey, and, we should we should we should get we into, should get into, there. The, yeah, into that's the China market. Basically, kind of right. what the article and, and, and was, so, so was saying. All the Western companies, without exception, that go into China have either uh, been screwed, will be screwed, or are currently in the process of being screwed because China, say it with me, is a country that uses gang rape as torture. That needs to be that needs to be the framework for any discussion about China and the Chinese Communist Party. That's going to be up to you watching. Whether seriously, when you're when you're talking about China with your friends and family online, this needs to be the 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 context of everything. Put it into terms that will really make people think. Yeah, well, that's why we often don't get invited to parties anymore. <laughs> yeah. That that and and COVID nineteen, the virus that was spread because of the Chinese Communist Party's cover up. That's right. <laughs> but but also prior to that, it's because we would say things like, "Oh, what do you do for a career?" Well, I talk about how China is a country <laughs> that uses gang rape as a form of torture. What do you do? <laughs> How's the kids? <laughs> the exit's right there. <laughs> Ah, oh, uh, kids. Oh, your kids are really growing up fast. So, you know, in China, there was a systematic uh, forced abortion campaign. Women were forcibly sterilized. So there could only be, why? Where are you taking me? Why? <laughs> no, I would actually often find myself kind of like in a corner talking to a few people about the Chinese Communist Party. And I don't mean for that to happen, but it always it, it happens, yeah. gets there. Yeah. 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 yeah we, we are not fun at parties. Yeah. Like we, with that, or like twenty-year-old cultural references. Remember, Snick, boy, you didn't have Nickelodeon. Your no, Chinese I'm sorry. parents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no cable. <laughs> ah, round at Clarissa explains it all. Uh, those oh, are my roundhouse. references. Down at the roundhouse. Yeah, are you afraid of the dark? Oh man, oh, there were such good Canadian show. made. Whoa, okay, I no longer like that show. What was a good one? Pete and Pete. Do yeah. you remember Pete and Pete? Pete and Pete, yeah. I have the DVD, Shelly. I'll show you. Pete. Pete and Pete holds up. That's the important takeaway. Wait, of this you episode. have the DVDs? Of Pete and Pete? Yeah, it's great. Wow. Michael Stipe of R.E.M. was in it as like this creepy uh, ice cream man in one episode. It was great. It was, <laughs> wow. it was a really good show. It still, it holds up. I mean, I watched Wishbone. I don't know. Ah, what's the story, Wishbone? And that ended up being like what you do in life. What? What's the story, Shelley? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> really? I should have been watching, uh, you know, TV shows about accountants. <laughs> That's uh, what my parents wanted. You can be anything when you grow up, an accountant or a doctor. <laughs> you know, pr preferably a CPA, you know. Is that when you like it's resuscitate a someone? It's a certified, it's a certified public, public accountant. accountant. Yeah. 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 It's an accountant, but you also have to pass like, some tests. Hey. hey. Well, speaking of accounting, this podcast is sponsored by Drake Illusion. Drake Illusion ERP system makes it possible to manage all areas of your business. It can replace QuickBooks and do much more, from automating tasks to software development as needed. It's a cloud-based enterprise resource planning system that allows you to have business-to-business -business communication. It helps you manage multiple e-commerce platform and shipping carriers from one centralized software. It helps you serve shoppers across all your sales channels from one solution. It's an all-in-one platform for your small or mid-sized company. Drake Illusion offers a solution that grows with your business. And now... Drake Illusion is offering up to 60% off for new clients. If you run a small business or a mid-sized business, Drake Illusion could be the perfect solution to save time and energy managing your company. For more information, go to drakeillusion.com slash ERP. The link is below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Oh, I thought you were going to say thanks for watching this episode. Okay. I might, <laughs> if we do the thing. I'm Shelly Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Line. <laughs> <laughs>